This is Kate. Welcome back to the Comfy Chairs. I think an appropriate way to introduce today's episode is with this line from a gloss or a short form verse by Irish poet Seamus Haney. Steady under strain and strong through tension. An essential element of both leadership and learning, our first preoccupations here at the Comfy Chairs, is adaptability, or the ability to move through a challenge and make changes while still remaining strong. The recent vocabulary about the human side of change has frequently revolved around the concept of resilience. The idea that an ability to spring back when you encounter change is the key to success. Imagine a rubber band snapping back to shape after every stretch. Not only is this a flawed model of what change demands of us, people have grown weary of resilience. Workers on the front line don't want to be told you just need to be resilient. Employees can't carry the weight of necessary changes this way. They need help and support, not admonitions. Well, this is a job for adaptability. Because rather than asking people to spring back when change happens, the job of leaders now is to name, demonstrate, and provide for the mindsets, skills, and experiences that fully enable adaptation. In this and the next episode, I'm fortunate to have a conversation with a friend who has graciously agreed to share both his professional and personal stories with us. Mr. Bevington, please. Well, thank you for having me here. It's a, it's yeah. a privilege. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Greg Bevington. Um, I guess it'll come up originally from Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and I've known Kate for several years, really. Is it eight years? That's right, before like, Nate and I got wow. married. Okay, yeah, wow. Yeah. Uh, quite a while. And it's, oh, been, it's gone fast. And it's been lovely. Um, but... Uh, I've been living in the U.S. for uh, a little over 11 years now, uh, and I work for a uh, wonderful company, uh, Select Additive Technologies, and we are a distributor of uh, industrial 3D print equipment to the manufacturing industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I was thinking about topics I wanted to include in Comfy Chairs episodes, one of the ones that is constantly a discussion when we think about leadership and obviously learning is adaptability. Mm -hmm. And I like to come up with topics and list, and list people and play a little matching game in my head. And I, Greg just kind of like popped off the paper uh, when I thought about the idea of adaptability uh, because not only has he, you know, entered a field that is brand new and constantly changing. Um, he's also, done things in his life that demonstrate the ability to change, grow, adapt, uh, moving across the world. When I know people, when I meet people like Greg who have made such significant changes, I'm always curious about not just the, the why, but the how. I'm very glad that you're here today. And I think the place for us to start is before we continue to throw the word adaptability around uh, to define what it means. And I've got, I've got the dictionary, the etymology behind it. Of mm -hmm. course you do too. Yep. Um, but let's set that aside for a second. And let me ask you when that word is, comes up, what do you think of first? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, for me, you know, adaptability is you know, just being able to take whatever is being thrown at you, right? Mm -hmm. Without, yeah. um, you know, I, I think people, when think of, people think about, you know, this, this person's adaptable, I have to be, I have to be adaptable uh, for everything. I mean, it's not the case, right? Exactly. Um, adaptability isn't in every aspect of your life, every situation, mm -hmm. right? You have to be adaptable at being adaptable. Yeah. The last person I interviewed, Aaron, she said several times in that conversation that context matters. Exactly. And uh, yeah, absolutely. That's universal. Absolutely. 
absolutely. Yeah, you know, and you know, I, for me, you know, um, and we'll we'll go through this. You know, <laughs> life throws a lot at you. Yeah. Right. And uh, if you're not going to be adaptable or flexible, mm-hmm. you have a break. I like associating it with. It may be a bit of a tired metaphor at this point, but like the reed that bends, mm-hmm. because if it's too brittle, if it's too rigid, it will snap. Absolutely, that uh, that hits very true uh, to me as as an Irishman. Uh, we have a thing called uh, one of our patron saints. Everyone knows our patron saint Saint Patrick. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have another patron saint Saint Bridget. Oh. I don't think I knew she was considered a patron. She saint. is also a patron, patron saint, yes. Okay. And uh, I believe, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we make a St. Bridget's cross. Okay. And we make that from reeds. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've seen the one that you have yeah, on I have house. it ha- have it over my door, yeah. 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 And that is, you can make it from that because exactly. it bends. Exactly. exactly. What a fun little connection. <laughs> well, let's, so you also went and studied the meaning of adaptability. Let's talk about that for a little bit. When you went and found, you know, it comes from the Middle French and Latin. Mm-hmm. Uh, what stood out to you? Uh, you know, the, the the dictionary definition, right, mm-hmm. of, of all conditions or new conditions. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with that, right? Well, I have to agree with it. It's the definition. Yeah. But um, it's not necessarily, you still have to be a, adaptable to reoccurring something that you've already experienced before yeah and and sometimes we we forget we don't we don't i think that's oh yeah i agree with you 100 mm-hmm. percent. because it can be so easy when we get through something you're like all right all well, done all done back yeah. to normal now right. you know one of the terms that comes up a lot with adaptability is resilience yeah and it has a place but i've in the last couple of years, I've started really chafing against the use of resilience mm-hmm. because I think the most common mental model that people use is very misleading, mm-hmm. and that's the rubber band. Yeah. So much content around change management. Mm-hmm. If you're going to be resilient, you've, it's that you know, getting back to the state, and that's not what change or even adaptation exactly. demands of us. Yeah. We have to be different as a result of it. We may bend and not break, but we're bent right. as a result of it. And the uh, the rubber band metaphor, I'm cautious about it because rubber bands break over time. Right. And that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> I don't I, want people to snap. You know, I, I like the analogy more of it's it's a road that you take. Okay. All right. So, you know, a lot of the time the road is straight. You're moving along and that's fine. But every now and then there's a turn in the road mm-hmm. and you either adapt and take the turn or you crash off the road. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. One of the one of the words in the definition of adapt that popped for me was suitable. Mm-hmm. And modify is a synonym as well. So mm-hmm. it's a, a suitable modification, yeah. you know, which goes back to your what's the context right. of it. I also love when you get into the derivative understanding of the original roots of the word, that there is a sense of intention, that it's this idea that we are prepared or put into a position and made ready. Being put into a position, being prepared and ready for the circumstance. Mm -hmm. I believe the conversation about adaptability is ongoingly relevant. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not going anywhere. No. Change is actually the one thing that we can count upon. It's been accelerated over the last few years. And anybody watching the news is seeing with AI, with workforce needs, that we are on the cusp of another big shift. And so we all have to be leaders, especially adaptable and ready to change and alter and take the turns. And that's why I thought of my friend Greg. And I think other than asking, how do we define it? um, My next first question for you is before I reached out and said, I want to talk about adaptability, Greg, I think you're the right person. Did you think of yourself as adaptable? 
I, I guess before that, no, not really. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess I didn't really think too deeply about, um, I just, uh, I am who I am mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, what you can only deal with what's put in front. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. In, in, in short, no, not really. Okay. Um, it's not something that I wouldn't say that that was my overwhelming quality, uh, that I would pinpoint. I think that gives us an interesting opportunity to have a conversation about kind of that unconscious competence. Mm -hmm. Because what I heard you say as we were getting everything hooked up is that, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I do know. Mm -hmm. I, I do know what this looks like. Mm -hmm. I have had the experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of it also is that... uh the the Irish condition, uh, we don't like to uh, be very boastful about our, about ourselves. Anyway. That's fair. That's fair. So, as you've been reflecting on this, what does the ability to prepare and modify, in your opinion, what does that look like out in the world? Out in the world, you know, I think um, you have to look at things from you try to look at things from all perspectives. It's very difficult at times, right? To to understand what someone else is thinking, what their meaning mm -hmm. behind what they're saying or doing is. But I think taking a step back and, uh, you, know, the, you know, the old thing of, you know, count 10 seconds before you respond, right? But uh, I, I think that trying to reflect on what the meaning behind something is um, Actually, interestingly enough, today I was just watching, uh, there was a, a tribute to the Irish singer Shane McGowan. He passed away a couple of days ago. And uh, one of his colleagues, Glenn Hansard, another famous Irish musician, was was talking and reminiscing about Shane. Oh, the Pogues. The Pogues, yeah, exactly. Thank you. So he was talking a lot about him, but uh, one of the things he said that Shane would always tell him when he's writing lyrics or thinking of lyrics is uh, find the truth. Mm -hmm. Find the truth in that lyric that you just wrote. So I think thinking about what's being said and finding what, you know, what the reality really is, because we like to, we like to connect the dots before the dots are actually there a lot of times. We come to our own conclusions yeah. without taking into consideration what someone else is saying. The thread that connects for me immediately is this idea of awareness, mm -hmm. that there has to be awareness of yourself. What is my, what's my default setting, if you will? And then am I aware of the circumstances and the other people? And am I not presuming that my take on things is the right way? Um, I'm also kind of seeing the connection to what you were telling me before I hit record about some of your earlier jobs working in menswear and retail mm -hmm. with different customers and clients so that what's true for this individual seems to be part of absolutely the skill. absolutely I mean you know I, I go back to you know I worked in men's retail for a long time when I was in college and a little bit afterwards as well you know you never know who's going to walk through that door mm -hmm. and uh you know, the aim of the game is treating everyone the same, but you have to interact with them in different ways. Yeah. Right. Um, so the, like I said, you know, before we started recording the, the bricklayer that came in on a Friday, you know, to, to get some new clothes, to go out, to have a few pints on a, on yeah. a Friday night or a Saturday <laughs> night. Um, you're going to interact with him in a different way than let's say the, the politician that's coming in for a suit. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's a different and you, and you have to be very, very flexible and do it at a drop of a hat. Yeah. Uh, but also can't force it. Yeah. Well, I like, you're treating everyone the same, but not really. Right. And that's a lesson for leadership. Mm -hmm. I had an employee once who was, she was my, like my top potential person and a very small team. Mm -hmm. That top potential person came to me one day, like, you have higher expectations of me than you do of so-and-so. Yeah, I do. Here's why. Mm -hmm. I know that you're capable of this. I know what your aspirations are. I believe we can get you to that point. 
Um, and this other person is in a significantly different role in a significantly different time in her career where she's heading toward retirement. You're going to be treated with the same respect, mm -hmm. but I do have higher expectations of you. And it took her, like she had to like go away and come back and digest that to understand that that was the right thing. She did want a manager that was adapting the approach and adapting the level of like, here's where you can perform. So we're going to have you up there. I'm treating you the same because I respect you both. I'm trying to give you as much autonomy as appropriate. And I'm evaluating where you are mm. in your career and abilities. And then it results in something different. And I think the working with retail customers is a good, so many of us have that background in our youth. Mm -hmm. It's a good, oh yeah, that makes sense. So now when I go lead my people, am I adjusting? Exactly. And I, and I think that's, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to leadership, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I work in an industry that's constantly evolving Yeah. and we're trying to talk to a lot of our customers that are in traditional manufacturing and uh, we're coming with this new wild technology in their eyes. Um, you know, we're trying to advise them on how they can utilize this. Mm -hmm. Well, if we don't explain what what it can and can't do correctly, they're going to have the wrong expectations running into this. Okay. Right? Yeah. So they're going to be very, very rigid. They're going to be very rigid on, well, this is the way I've always done it. Mm -hmm. Why would I change? Yeah. Right? So when we come into a situation like that, we need to tell them, listen, these are the benefits. Mm -hmm. Or in a lot of cases, we're like, well, the way you've been doing it is the right way and we'll walk away. Right. Or we, or we may try and pivot and say, well, if, if you look at something else, what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, we, you know, my company is very, we're very customer focused. Mm -hmm. uh, I know all, all companies say that, but it's truly the, the decisions we make are through that lens mm -hmm. of what's right for the customer. Well, if you're telling somebody our product isn't right for you because it is the genuine truth regardless of not getting the sale, that's the action that speaks for Absolutely. the value there. Absolutely. And that is that is adaptable customer service exactly. because what is suitable, right? Mm -hmm. Modifying the sales pitch, modifying what the goal is exactly for that customer. Uh, yeah. It's a wonderful demonstration and way to think about adapting your approach. I shared with you that I think there's the event and choice um, dichotomy, if you will, when it comes to the skills, knowledge, and abilities associated with adaptability, mm -hmm. that there are times where things happen to us and we have to learn it, and then times where we make choices and we get to apply what we know professionally there's one story and then personally there's kind of another mm -hmm. and I think talking a little bit about some of your life experiences is a good lens for us to understand how um, somebody can become more adaptable mm -hmm. do you want to start with your immigration sure uh, I mean I could tell the, the lovely stereotypical love story that sounds like it's made up it does sound a little made it up. Does. It's so cool it, that it's true. It really does. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in the what we say the mid mid two thousands, late two thousands. So I was living in Limerick City, okay. in Ireland, and um, you know, going about my life, uh, nothing nothing too crazy. I wasn't uh, setting the world alight. Uh, with what I was doing, but um, it's probably the best thing for I, most people in their mid twenties. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but I, I, I'd taken a taken a couple of weeks off work, hanging around with my buddies, and uh, we decided to go to a bar. Uh, where we walked in and uh, noticed a, a lovely lady in the in the <laughs> the side of uh, of the bar. Took note, um, <laughs> but also thought to myself, "Well, she's way out of my league. I'm not going to talk to her." So. Went into a little corner with my buddies, and we were we were 
having a couple of drinks. Uh, thankfully, she has a lot more confidence than I do. She walked up to me, introduced herself, and asked if she could sit down. Melissa was her name, and uh, we, we hit it off instantly. Exchanged numbers that night, and uh, she was on a study abroad program. Okay. She was in the country for about a month, and uh, we spent most of that time together. Yeah. She went home, kind of thought that was going to be the end of it, but uh, we spoke every day, every single day, and uh, we started traveling over and back to each other. We would see each other twice a year okay. for four years. We were dating for um, about a year, maybe. Things were going, things were going fine. I'd met her parents. She's met, she'd met mine. Um, one day, I, I get a phone call. She was supposed to come over um, to see me in Ireland, and uh, I get a phone call from her father, saying that uh, Melissa's been taken into the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, she hadn't been feeling well over the la- the previous couple of weeks. And uh, turned out it was cancer. Um, I immediately dropped everything I was doing. Um, took out my credit card and didn't think about it, and uh, jumped on a plane to go see her. So she had she had just gone through surgery. Everything had gone gone well. Uh, it, was, it was colon cancer. Little did I know, I found out about two years later, while I was sitting in the hospital, she was actually going to break up with me. Oh. Because she didn't want me to go through that. Thankfully, she didn't. She went through through chemo, and um, we still spoke every day. After about two years, she went into remission. Uh, it was fantastic. You know, this was going on four years of us dating, and I said, well, I guess this is going well. <laughs> um should probably do something about this so we ended up getting engaged yeah and then the big conversation started about who was who was who was going to go where yeah big big conversation i bet big conversation so you know during this time you know she had persuaded me to go back to college you know she had just come out of remission all of her doctors were over there ireland was still in the grips of a recession at the time so you know for her to come to ireland would have been bit of a struggle, mm-hmm. you know, to find work. I drew the short straw and uh, <laughs> made the decision to move to her, to lovely Ohio. It was a big step, right, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to to leave everything behind, all my family and friends. It's, it's easy to get trapped into thinking about, well, this is what I'm leaving behind. This is going to make me very sad, yeah. all of this kind of stuff. But I also had the the part of me going, well, I get to be with this amazing woman. There's a lot of opportunity out here. So I started looking to the positives then to uh, to kind of shun away the negative thoughts there. Not to say that they weren't weren't there. There was always a little bit of apprehension, but uh, obviously it went well. I'm here 11 years. It was it, it was a challenge coming over. Though. You know, you talk about adaptability. Uh, you know, I'm looking at it going this is an easy move I, you know i i know the u.s uh, I, I i watch american tv all the time i've been going there like once a year for right? the last four years ex- i must know ex- it exactly i speak yeah. the language i speak the language or so i thought <laughs> um that that was a a, a big uh a, an adjustment for me um i get very frustrated when people don't understand me so when i first moved here uh my my accent was a little thicker. Um, I can imagine. You've, you've heard how thick it gets. Um, <laughs> occasionally when I have a, a, a beverage or two. Um, but, uh, you know, I had to adjust. I had to slow down my speech, enunciate my words. Uh, especially when I'm, you know, I, I call customers over the phone. And oh. you're, trying to, you're trying to communicate, you know, some technical stuff. That makes a lot um, of sense. You want them to understand you. And... Uh, so I, I, the the accent I speak with when when my accent isn't too thick, I call that my work accent. Um, my work accent has uh, overflowed into my normal life now, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, especially when I go home and everyone makes fun of me. <laughs> for too sa- adaptable for, for saying trash and uh, gas station and things like that. Oh. Yeah. 
what was the first kind of big, oh, this is different when you made your move? Do you remember? I, I think the, the one of the first things that I always remember is, uh, so where I grew up in, in rural Ireland, there's a lot of hills and mountains and things, things like that. Um, I remember flying into Ohio in the daytime and going, where, where are the hills? Where, like, no. it's flat as the eye can see. No, we don't have those, my friend. Uh, that was, uh, <laughs> that, that, that was a big shock. Uh, even the, even the simple things, uh, you know, going to the grocery store, right? Yeah. You kind of take that for granted, right? You, you kind of, you go into any grocery store in the U S it's kind of a similar layout, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a little different for, for me. Uh, one example is, um, first time I went grocery shopping, um, I had to get eggs. So I went to where I would normally think eggs are in a grocery store and they were nowhere to be found. They're not refrigerated, are they? We do not refrigerate our eggs. It's a very, very uh, different thing for uh, us. And and I, I'm a, uh, I can be a little bit stubborn sometimes, so I don't like to ask really? for help a lot. Really? Yeah, I know, right? Never seen that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that was a, that was a big shock to me, uh, that, uh, that, that was a little different, but. Okay. It's it's those small things that I, they add up. I bet they know. do. Uh, you know, you're you become a you become a creature of habit sometimes, and uh, you know, little things like uh, always being av able to have your favorite cereal every morning, right? Um, getting getting the brands that you normally normally have uh, for the last twenty nine years. And then you're in this foreign country and you're trying to find stuff that isn't full of sugar. <laughs> yeah, you're out of luck here. It, it, it makes me think that um, in some ways it's the small differences, those things that are adding up, as you said, that become the source of change fatigue or burnout for people. Mm -hmm. The big stuff, you know, it's the, oh, I'm moving. I get to be with this woman. You know, it's going to be an adventure, and then I can't get my favorite tea. Yeah. Nothing tastes the same. I can't find the eggs. Mm -hmm. um, the minimal pieces become big. Yeah. And, th and then you go into slightly bigger things like, well, now I need a doctor. I need a dentist. Yeah. How do I get all my, my records transferred over? Uh, mm -hmm. That type of thing. Did you finish your degree at that point? Yes, I okay. finished my degree at that point, yeah. I don't think I knew that. She made you go, not made, but that she convinced you to go back yeah. to school. I really love hearing that. Yeah, yeah. So she, uh, education was a big, mm -hmm. big thing for her. So you've made the move. Made the move. You're here in the States. I'm here in the States. Um, and you were engaged at that point, right? Uh, I was engaged until the day after I arrived. Um, so I don't know if anyone knows, but the immigration process is quite complicated and drawn out. Um for me, um, I I came over on a fiancé visa. Okay. Uh, you may have seen the show 90 Day Fiancé. That was me. Um, <laughs> not quite, but... Um, <laughs> but uh, Melissa was always very... Uh, wanted to get things done, very efficient. Okay. Uh, paperwork had to be done. Um, you know, cross the T's and dot the lowercase j's. Um but the day after, she actually wanted to get married the day I arrived. But <clears throat> I, I was I was pretty tired. So little intense. She, I she, she she gave me a day uh, half a day of relaxation. <laughs> um, but we uh, we decided we would get married. We would have uh, just the two of us. We'd go to the courthouse in Xenia. Okay. And uh, and do what we would call our our paperwork wedding. And then three months later, we were going to have our actual wedding which we had in Puerto Rico. We had all mm -hmm. our families together. It was beautiful. But um, we got married as soon as we could because you have to put your paperwork through. Uh, I had to wait six months before I could actually work. Okay. I, I was not allowed to work for Oof. six months. And you've been working a long time. Since I was about 13. Yeah. That's, <laughs> speaking of adaptation. <laughs> 
yeah. So that that was a challenge. Uh, her father kept me busy, which was nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was moving to a new office, so uh, I was uh, the muscle, uh, for lack of a better <laughs> term. Uh, Dog's body. There we go. But, um, you know, that was very frustrating for me, uh, not being able to work. Um, I had already a, a job lined up, and they were just waiting for me then. Okay. <clears throat> um, to get going. Um, I did have a wedding to plan. That was all on my shoulders. That was that was wonderful. Um, it's kind but, of a fun, uh, you know, quote unquote, non traditional thing in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was uh, mostly um, her father and me did a lot of the work uh, organizing this. Um, but uh, she claimed she didn't want to organize it, but would uh, critique everything we did. <laughs> you know, that in, is a woman's that, prerogative. That, that is, absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, you know, that kept me busy for a while. And, uh, you know, finally I, I got to enter the American workforce, uh, which which in itself, like I said, was a little bit of a challenge with accents and yeah. things like that. Uh, you know, working in, you know, my background is engineering. Uh, coming to the United States, one one big issue is um, you guys don't use like to use the metric system too much. We do not. Um, we do, so we if, very much do not. We go a long way to not use it. Exactly. I mean, even even today, eleven years later, it, when when someone starts talking to me in inches, you'll hear me go silent for about ten seconds while I do the calculation in my head to understand what they're talking about. I'm getting a little better. What's the conversion? I've never, that's never like firmed up in my head. 24.5 millimeters to an inch. Okay. That is unpleasant math. We can edit that if that's wrong, right? Look it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Oh, wrong way around. So what is, what is it? 25.4 millimeters to an inch. Nice round number, you know, 25.4. Love it. Is that something that you feel like even though it's weird and maybe a little annoying, my words, not yours, um, <laughs> do you feel like you've adapted to it? It's just oh, the absolutely. circumstance. It's, it's second nature at this point. Yeah. You know? Well, and there there are things too that you decide this isn't, this is not where I'm going to plant my stake, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. This is something I will change around. Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, I've gone almost so far the other way now where we'll talk in, in weight, right? So pound, mm. pounds over here, kilograms in 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 Ireland, and uh, they'll talk about, you know, I, I talk to my father about sport a lot. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll be talking about something. I'm like, oh, he's about, you know, 210 pounds. He's like, what are you talking about? What's that in <laughs> kilograms? I'm like, actually, I have no idea. I, I can't do the math in my head. It would be... It would be nice if we were all on the same system. Well, you yeah. know. It's it's never going to happen. No. Nope. But... No. Too expensive. Well, expensive. And there's also, there is a connection to identity, right, wrong, or indifferent. But the U.S. has kind of tied up its understanding of itself with things like, we don't use metric. Mm-hmm. And that's a horrible sweeping generalization. But it does illustrate that you have to have a certain amount of humility mm-hmm. to be somebody who adapts because those sorts of changes, things like I'm going to flex and use the system, mm-hmm. I'm going to change my style, I'm going to adapt my accent, mm-hmm. um, the examples you've shared, you're setting aside your own ego when you do that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess. And, you know, in all honesty, it was a struggle sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I did have that thought about, you know, what does this do to my identity as an Irish person? Yeah. You know, um, especially when you go home and guys are messing with you, calling you the Yank. Uh, <laughs> well, now that you're a citizen, it's, all, it's yeah, true. I know, right? <laughs> well, it's, uh, yeah, this Christmas will be my, my first time home as a real Yank, so. Yeah. Get ready. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is. It's That's one of the things I think it, that is central to being good at adapting is 
is recognizing that your ego maybe needs to take a back seat. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's not an easy thing to do. It's not. No. But it's like counterintuitively, it's also very freeing. Absolutely. Yeah. Because then to your point, for those recurrent things or because the next change is going to happen, it mm-hmm. just is, then you're you're freer. Mm-hmm. Because life throws things at you. Yep. Yeah. That's that's interesting. You know, you talk about, you know, it's it's very freeing. I'm probably skipping ahead a little bit here. Do it. Um This uh, this is quite a, a personal story, but um I'll decide if I want to keep that in later. Okay. But you know, you talk about that um very freeing. And, and adaptability. So when, after Melissa passed away, I meet a lot of new people all the time, right? And no matter how much of my work accent I put on, they'll still hear a little bit of, a little bit of Irish, right? And it'll come up with this, and where are you from? I hear a bit of an accent. I'll tell them I'm from Ireland. And first question they'll ask me is, what brought, to you, brought you to the U.S.? Guilty. Right. And for quite a while after Melissa passed away, I used to lie to them and go, oh, just uh, came over for work. And it ate at me a little bit. And I, I took a pause about, eventually took a pause and went, why am I doing this? And I realized it's to save the other person from that awkwardness. Mm. At my own expense. I said, well, why am I doing this? So eventually I just, I stopped doing that. And I, I would tell them my, my late wife was yeah. from Ohio and I, I moved here. And it actually, it, be, it became very freeing, but it also allowed some other people that I've met to open up. Um, I have a story. I was just recently in France for the Rugby World Cup and uh, I was be- meeting some of my friends over there, but I got there a little bit early and uh, could check into my Airbnb. So I decided to go to a, to a cafe, sat outside with all my bags and uh, there was a couple beside me sitting at the sitting right beside me and uh, me being one of never meeting a stranger uh, in my this life um, struck up a conversation with them we start. we were talking for you know 15 20 minutes or something like that and uh, the question came up so what what brought you over to the states and I told them well you know my late wife she, she was from Ohio and you know, we dated for four years and ended up moving over. And the two of them took a look at each other. It was a, they both, both looked at each other. And I said, well, actually, um, they lost their son about a little, about a year before, <clears throat> sorry, about a year before then. Um, it was actually a pretty high profile um, oh. incident that happened um, that I was aware of okay. and uh, we spent the next 40 minutes talking about about their son and uh, you know this was a trip that he was supposed to be on um, his younger brother was there but his friends were taking care of him and I mean without being flexible to or adaptable to you know share what I what I had to say you know we wouldn't have had that experience yeah. with each other well, it's those choices that you made years before set you on that path that turn yeah. that you took and you got to give the gift of hearing their story and you got to make a connection with people yeah. that way and that's when we make the choice to 
to grow. Those are the types of benefits we can reap down the road. And it's it's not fun or easy. No. But it's it, worthwhile. It's not. You know, those being able to make a genuine connection with someone these mm-hmm. days. Right. It's few and far between. Exactly. You know, so so that, you know, really being, you know, coming back to adaptability, being open is the is the big key there. Yeah. You have to be open. I do want to, and we kind of skipped from Mm -hmm. getting married to um, the news of Melissa's death. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put salt in that particular wound. And it's a big part of your story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've been become a lot more comfortable with talking about it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, every now and then I'll still break down, but yeah, um, that's uh, that's the 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 nature of the beast, as it were. But you know, <clears throat> you know, Melissa and I got married um, on uh, April first of all days. Um, <laughs> her her idea, not mine. But uh, we had a wonderful time in in Puerto Rico. We had. Uh, the Irish and the Puerto Ricans got together and uh, we had one hell of a party. But um, we got home to Ohio um, maybe a few weeks afterwards and uh, Melissa had her had her check up and uh, we unfortunately got the news that the cancer was back. Um, that was a big punch in the gut. Uh, and uh you know s- stuff had to change again um i was just just started work um and melissa had to go back into chemo again um she went into chemo and then uh we tried to she needed to have surgery okay um but a lot of the doctors that she went to didn't want to do it. This was very high risk uh, of where, where the cancer was located. And uh, we finally went to uh, a doctor at the James in, in Columbus who, who said, yeah, I'll do it. Of course I'll do it. You know, um, she endured a very, very long, surgery I think it was eight or nine hours and uh, came out of it no problem Uh, Melissa's a very tough woman and uh, you know recovered from that surgery it was was tough Um, but we had a lot of support as well Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's something people lose sight of as well tell me more about that you you don't have to do everything by yourself one of the most important things about about adaptability right is know when to ask for help you're absolutely right Greg you know this is a extreme this is an extreme case um where where you have to go through this, but people go through this all the time, but they don't do it alone. And, you know, you need to, again, we talk about putting your ego aside a little bit because sometimes ego can come into this. It's like, be stubborn, I can do this myself. Um, but, you know, leaning on the people that are willing to help and understanding that you're not being a burden that's very, very important. Um, so this was, you know, obviously it upended our lives for, for a while. And um, after the surgery and that, we thought things were going going okay. And then a couple of, I would say, a few months later, things started to look a little bit strange again. Mm. Uh, numbers were going up again. And... Uh, there was 
a little bit of confusion about what was going on. And uh, we finally found out that the the cancer had metastasized and uh, had moved into her into her bones. And, okay. Um, you know, we were still trying to look for hope somewhere. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, Melissa lost her her very heroic battle. Um. And, you know, it was a, um, a day that no one wants to experience. It's, um, I'm trying to find my thought here. You want to take a break? No, I'm okay. Okay. Um, you know, it, you know, a day like that for me, you know, this was the reason why I'd come to the United States. Yeah. And, you know, it's a rug that's pulled from underneath you but underneath that rug is an abyss. Oh, and Greg, that, <laughs> oof, not to minimize it, but what a visceral way to talk about what you experienced. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I've had time to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of time, too much time. But again, you know, you have, luck, luckily for me, um, I had some fantastic people around me. You know, her her family was there. Um, we're still very, very close. Um, that, those relationships are really precious. I, I count myself lucky that I get to like witness how that your family, how her family treats mm -hmm. you. Yeah, they're, um, they're special. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And, you know, I also had a, you know, good network of friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, and thankfully, uh, my work was amazingly understanding. Um, gave me whatever I needed. And uh, as much time as I wanted um, to come back, I actually got a, while I was off on bereavement leave, um, got a call from one of the executive vice presidents yeah. to say, check up on me first, and then said to me, you take as much time as you need. We'll be here whenever you're ready to come back. Wow. And, you know, I think I'm very lucky in that respect. Um, I don't know if every company is like that. They I don't not. think so. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's a very difficult time where you're trying to figure out what's next, right? Yeah. Um, what, do, what do you do? How do you cope? Um, and sometimes well, sometimes not. It's the, and, and, something and, that and you would never choose for yourself. Right. And what happens next? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when we talk in terms of adaptability right we we'll go back to that i think some people think it's an instantaneous thing that you do that it's a it's a physical act mm -hmm. that you do but it's it's not again i go back to that analogy of the road it's journey mm -hmm. um and sometimes sometimes the turns are the right turns sometimes the turns are the wrong turns yeah. you um, miss your turn a lot a, a, a lot of the time yeah no absolutely and uh, it's it's not instantaneous, and it's not it's a it's a combination of things that you you do, you get people to help you do, and uh, you know I I used to use 
a little bit of a, a little bit of a mantra of um just put one one foot in front of the other that's mm-hmm. and that's some days that's all I could do yeah. and if I can do that I'm moving in the correct direction mm-hmm. um like I say sometimes wrong sometimes right turns but you're still still trying to move forward sometimes it's one foot yeah it, you don't necessarily absolutely. get to take like a thousand steps yeah. some days you get one step and that's obviously the case with grief it's also the case when people are faced with any type of life-changing event Mm -hmm. job loss yeah um decisions being taken from you or are you perceiving that Mm -hmm. as such you know i I don't want it to be the constant refrain but the pandemic did that to people too and it's never about putting somebody's loss or circumstances, you know, like on a scale above or below. Right. It's acknowledging the fact that when those things happen, that we would never choose for ourselves, the changes you have to make are sometimes those incremental, I'm just going to move my toe forward. Right because it's all I can do. Mm-hmm. And if it's all you can do, then you've done it. Yeah. You're right, though. It's not immediately. Anybody that's watched a child grow mm-hmm. and experienced a teenager going through growth spurts, mm-hmm. you know that there's a process. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing, Melissa. I always appreciate that. Yeah. And I know I've said it before. I'm sorry I never met her. Mm. No, you would have loved her. Mm -hmm. Everyone did. I am going to grant us a break at this point. Please look for the second half of our conversation next week when Greg and I continue to talk about how adaptability is fed with curiosity, humility, and support. Thank you. You'll find Comfy Chairs updates and other thoughts on leadership and learning on Instagram at 123 Limited. That's O-N-E-2-3-L-T-D. Until next time.